Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 22, The Necessity of Creating a Political Crisis, featuring Margaret Kimberly. Margaret Kimberly is an editor and senior columnist at the Black Agenda Report, which publishes news, commentary, and analysis from the Black Left. She is author of the book Presidential, Black America and the Presidents, which is an eye-opening and very well-researched volume published by Steerforth Press. She contributed to the anthology In Defense of Julian Assange, which includes essays by over three dozen other well-known figures, including Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, and Matt Taibbi. Margaret is also on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace, which seeks to recapture and redevelop the historic anti-war, anti-imperialist, and pro-peace positions of the radical black movement. Margaret and I spoke on July 2nd, 2020, and we covered a lot of topics. The George Floyd protests, the groundbreaking movement that seems to be emerging from them, the need for organization and leadership to push the movement forward, the importance of community control of the police, the importance of removing monuments and statues, including Mount Rushmore, how COVID has increased the intensity of the recent protests, the COVID disaster in general, the cultural resistance to wearing masks, the unfortunate indulgence of the left in COVID conspiracy theories, the inability of U.S. Americans to come together in solidarity, the hope provided by young people living in a time of collapse, the unfortunate selection of Biden, the lack of free and fair elections in the U.S., the Green Party, how third parties don't spoil elections, how the Black Alliance for Peace connects domestic and foreign policy issues, and the need for radical revolutionary change. Well, I really appreciate you coming back and doing another conversation with me on my podcast, Margaret. It's great. Oh, I love it. Thank you. I wanted to start by talking about the George Floyd protests. And Uh at the time when they were really raging, it felt like something unprecedented was going on. And I'm wondering if, uh, well, was it something unprecedented? Is Is it going to be as significant as it was feeling like i think so it's um i think it it still can be as you as you've said the number of protests has died down but i i don't think this is going away um uh i think it's unprecedented first of all i it's been a long time since i have seen a protest that was so um uh, diverse, that was so interracial. Um, in in past uh, incidents like this, most of the people who protested were black. Um, I don't recall seeing as many white people involved uh, on the the issue that uh, sparked the protest, the issue of police violence. But I think a lot has changed in the last few years. People are um, suffering. Uh, there is a lot of um, you know, it's funny, Occupy, what year was that, 2010, 2011? Oh, my God, I feel so old. <laughs> 2011. Uh, mm-hmm. 2011. Um, I, that was obviously crushed by the, by the Democrats, of course. Obama was president when that uh, ended. Um, but I think these protests bring, um, build on each other, and I bring that up to say that we should not be surprised that so many people have a uh, reason to express their opposition to the system. So Occupy, uh, their, the term the 1% was coined, and issue of inequality, and student loan debt, all of these things that haven't gone away, that have not gotten any better, that have worsened. So even when a movement seems to end, I think we ought to remember that um, 
it doesn't it hasn't really gone away it hasn't gone away in people's minds um uh, people still want the things that caused that the prior protest to take place. So here we are nearly 10 years later. And what's happened since? Well, we have greater inequality. We have um, the movement for black lives, which is it's complicated because there's an organization which brought uh, the words Black Lives Matter to the public, uh, although I think too much attention is paid to them. The words Black Lives Matter have become a rallying cry for so many things. Um, and uh, so that movement uh, seemed to disappear. But as I just said, that didn't really disappear either. So now you have, here we are in 2020, we are, now we have a pandemic, which uh, the quarantine used to uh, fight the pandemic created economic dislocation, uh, 35 million new unemployment applications and a system that doesn't even uh, allow people to file for their benefits at presidential election year, when the uh, most progressive candidate, Bernie Sanders, was again done in. They rigged the system against him. Uh, this time he didn't even fight back, though. He uh, capitulated earlier than he did last time. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, repudiated all the things he claimed to have believed in. But the millions of people who supported him were, I, I've been saying, all dressed up with nowhere to go. Um, and uh, so there is this still this uh, desire uh, and passion for change about many different things. Um, about uh, police uh, brutality. I mean, things that were... Um, uh, consigned to a small group, like talk of police abolition or prison abolition or defunding the police, which is problematic. I'll get into that. But these things are now uh, being heard all the time by much larger groups of people. Uh, uh, white people protesting in solidarity with black people. Uh, it's been a long time since we've seen that. So it, it doesn't matter if there are fewer protests. I don't. I think it would be a mistake to think that this m movement is over. I, I really think this is um, uh, this is something very new and and groundbreaking. That's. I'm really happy to hear you say that. Um, I am in Southwest New Mexico in a very rural area. It's also it's very isolating from people. So I haven't seen any of this stuff myself in person. I've only been reading uh, reports and seeing videos, you know. So have have you were you, were you able to go to any of the events that happened in New York? I did. I went to one protest. Um, I didn't stay very long. It was it was in Harlem, 125th Street, the main thoroughfare in Harlem. Um, it, well, I'm, my age is, uh, is showing. I didn't have the stamina, frankly, to stick around all, all afternoon and then march. Um, but uh, there was a large crowd of people. It was at least a thousand. I'd say forty percent were white. Um, and uh, I was a little. I was uncomfortable by the uh, with the police presence. There were more and more cops arriving, and it looked like they were starting to shut down the subway. Uh, and I was concerned about being able to get home. I also had a prior appointment, but uh, but yes, that was the one I attended. I was frankly nervous. The police uh, were just out of control. They were arresting bystanders. They were grabbing people's bicycles. I don't know. The police academy must tell, tell them something about a bicycle being a weapon or something, because people who weren't even in the protest, they were snatching people's bikes. They were beating people. Uh, um, there's video of a, a police cars, uh, driving into a crowd and, uh, fortunately not, uh, harming anyone. The violence that we hear about the looting and the property crime was frankly much less than the, uh, crimes committed by the police. And uh, New Yorkers now, as others are, are demanding that police be defunded, but that's problematic. Uh, the New York City budget was just passed within the last 48 hours. And basically, it's a shell game. The uh, Mayor de Blasio took money from uh, um, uh, 
their school safety officers and he took the, uh, the those budget lines out of the NYPD and put them in the Department of Education. And every city agency has a hiring freeze except the NYPD. So they shuffled some money around so it looks like they cut the police, but they didn't really. And I've been hearing about this across the country. I think we need to be talking about community control of the police. And we need more organizing. Um, I, it's been a long time since Americans have uh, uh, had a successful mass movement like this. And I, I think, frankly, people don't know what to do. Uh, and the people who led these movements before are, if they're not passed away, they're elderly. So people are trying to figure it out as they go along and that it's good for the spontaneity. But at this point, this is the point where you need people who know what they're doing. And uh, uh, we at Black Alliance for Peace in particular have been mobilizing to organize people. Um, uh, and that's, you know, a challenge for because other people also are similarly inexperienced. But um, we and we also need to um, I don't know how to say this because George Floyd died because he was black. That's very clear to me. But people who are not black are suffering a lot of I, I mentioned the pandemic. Uh, our community was hit the, the hardest. Um, and that is an injustice created by our system. Uh, a friend of mine, Sarah Flounders, wrote an article about uh, COVID and the countries with the best survival rates were socialist countries. So here we are in this country with no um, no coherent health care system. And it showed when this uh, medical emergency uh, appeared. So uh, it's important to to remember and to point out all of the systemic injustices that have created uh, well, capitalism, first of all, just to say that, uh, created this failed state. We, uh, there's no other way to describe the United States. You know, Dr. Fauci um, admitted recently that from the beginning they knew people should wear masks, but they were afraid of running out of them. And they were afraid that uh, medical uh, professionals wouldn't have masks. So we're always told America is so great and so powerful and so wonderful, but we have a system that can't make masks. And all this criticism of China, which is um, uh, phony and not to be uh, given any credence, uh, this pandemic started in China. They've had fewer than 5,000 deaths. The United States has had more than 120,000. So um, I, I think we have to keep all of that in mind we have to have international solidarity because that's what will end uh, the injustices that people are living through. A serious discussion about capitalism, solidarity amongst people in this country, solidarity in people with other countries. So it's bigger than uh, the issue that um, uh, sparked the protest. And as I said, I think uh, that is what uh, created this uh, more diverse group of protesters. There are people who want change and they keep being told they can't have it, that it can't be done, that uh, you have to go away, that uh, the one presidential candidate who talked about any kind of, of reform uh, was beaten down again. And we were told that's it, be quiet, shut up, uh, go along with the most right-wing Democrat you could possibly find, and he's the one we have to get behind to fight Trump. And your concerns about uh, minim uh, living wage work and um, uh, going broke because you get sick, assuming the system doesn't kill you, all of these things have to be forgotten. And, but people have not forgotten. They still want change of a, um, a wide variety of change, and uh, I think that's why this movement has staying power. That's very encouraging to hear. I, I want to hone in on the issue of defunding the police uh, as opposed to or um, in relation to community control of police. You had a guest on Black Agenda Radio recently who talked about this and talked yes. about how uh, community control is more important than merely defunding. 
Yeah, community. We need community control of the police. The right to hire, to fire, to subpoena. The idea that people can come into a community and do what they want. Um, that's why we have a thousand police killings every year, an average of three people every day. Um, so it seems uh, to me it's quite logical. It's an old demand. It's one of the ten points of the uh, Black Panthers demands from the late '60s. Um, and we need community control over our lives. We need a real public sphere. We we have a public sector that is um, uh, that is constantly shrinking because of austerity. That's been demonized in this political system that moves ever rightward. So uh, in asking for uh, community control of the police, we're at also asking for community control of uh, many other things as well, rather than um, uh, being told that your neighborhood's gentrifying and you have to get out, or they're cutting funding for public schools again, or there's no public housing. All these things people need uh, we need to have a voice. And far from being the democracy that we are always told we live in, we lived in an old, we live in an oligarchy, a, a kleptocracy. Um, I, I don't know how many words there are to describe it, but it's not a democracy. Uh, they let us vote, but we don't really get to make the choice. The people, even the people we like are, are bought off. And, um, uh, so that is true democracy, having um, uh, a say in uh, one's life and uh, uh, all of the uh, a say in all of the uh, decisions that government uh, makes. I want to return to the point that you made earlier about organizing. I, it has struck me that a big part of the reason why the George Floyd protests became so big was because of the role played by social media in distributing so much material, especially video material that was really showing what was going on. But that, for the most part, that kind of material is very emotional. And the emotional part is really good for getting people out there and getting in a crowd and making demands, but it does seem like it lacks other aspects that were needed for success. And it seems like that's where organizing comes in. Yes, it does. And, um, you know, we've tried this leaderless thing with, that was one of the problems with Occupy, I believe, and the movement for black lives. We have to thank them for putting this uh, issue front and center, but they were also another leaderless organization and people can, you know, I right now I can start or you can start a Black Lives Matter uh, New Mexico, um, which has nothing to do with this uh, organization movement for black lives and um, uh, which is problematic. They're close to the Democratic Party and they're wealthy uh, funders. But um, uh, we need uh, it's, it's a good thing that people have this passion but the lack of organizing is um, is problematic because then people are susceptible to this um, defund the police, which sounds like a good idea. And then the people who are our opposition say they don't want it and they give credibility to what is actually not a good idea. So um, to, to really have... Um, uh, those uh, uh, forces who are knowledgeable and who are um, spending a lot of time on these issues is uh, is is really essential. Uh, but that's something that's uh, that's missing. But I I'm still optimistic that um, uh, people are taking matters into their own hands. It's a good thing. I, I believe the um, uh, first was called Chaz and it was called. Was it Chop in Seattle? They yes. changed the name and confused me. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, the city has come in to uh, disperse them. But we have something similar here in New York in City Hall Park, um, where a couple thousand people have taken up residence over the past uh, week. So there is a sort of organizing going on. And uh, uh, that's a good sign. But what are the next uh, steps? How do you keep from being fooled into asking for something that is really not what you think it is? Um, 
and to maintain solidarity and and keep the um, keep those demands going. You know, everybody has. Uh, it's interesting. You can tell this movement has been successful when you see the way corporate America has has connected itself. So now we're told. Um, uh, finally, Aunt Jemima has to come off the box. No more Uncle Ben's. Uh, Gone with the Wind can't be in a movie. Uh, Juneteenth should be a national holiday. The Dixie Chicks have to get rid of the word Dixie. Um, and I guess those things are okay, but we can't fall for that. We can't have Democratic politicians wearing Kenta cloth and taking a knee when they haven't addressed any of the uh, the concerns that or issues that the protesters are raising. So that is a problem too. But um, I'm, I'm most concerned about people being um, being taken in by things that are, as in case you can't tell from what I just said, that are not important. I don't care if Juneteenth isn't a national holiday. I don't really care. Um, I want police killings to stop. I want uh, the minimum wage to go up. I want uh, the austerity to end. I want the wars to end. Uh, and I'm not happy with uh, if I got Medicare for all, but we still had wars of aggression, that wouldn't make me very happy. So um, I, I, am cons- I think people are learning, but not fast enough. Move, um, uh, events are moving quickly, and um, I'm, I'm a little concerned that people aren't, uh, aren't keeping up. But I think that's the the lack of of organizing. But we're we're out there, uh, Black Alliance for Peace and other groups, uh, connecting all of these uh, these issues. So um, you know, and people I never heard of before, which is fine, to know that all over the country there are people who are um, establishing their own leadership uh, on a local level. So uh, I I I think. This can maintain uh, the movement can grow into something that really accomplishes something for us. Right. So something like the uh, demands for statues coming down, you would see that as being possibly a distraction. I would actually I would not. I I think the monuments issue is is important. I, um, I I think it's it's I think it's an excellent thing that people are have stopped um, bowing down to these narratives that um, tell us that someone who committed a genocide is is heroic, uh, whether it's our slaveholder presidents or Winston Churchill who caused a famine in India that killed several million people. Uh, who uh, sent poison gas to um, Iraq in the 1920s when uh, they uh, people there rebelled against British rule, against King Leopold of the Congo, who killed some, at least 10 million people. Uh, I think it's important for all of this to be questioned. So I think it's a good start. Um, so in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy, and they had, I, I can't remember what it's called, um, but there's a main thoroughfare there where there were statues of Robert E. Lee and you know all these Confederate leaders. And all overnight, these statues that we were told can never come down and it's complicated. And overnight, they're gone, gone. Um, but again, we can't be satisfied with that. Uh, and we have to broaden uh, what what that means. Who's we, it's easy to say the slaveholder statue should come down, but should Barack Obama get a statue um, after destroying Libya, killing thousands of people? George W. Bush and his father killed millions of uh, people in Iraq, one with the war and sanctions, one with an invasion. Should they have a, a statue? I would say no. So um, I, I believe that is a good, healthy start, but it has to be broadened. And uh, we can't just talk about the obvious villains. There are a lot of villains out there. And uh, I say um, include all of them. A leader in the Sioux Nation has made the call again, which they've made numerous times in the past, for Mount Rushmore to be dismantled. Yes, it was... um, 
uh, the, the Black Hills of South Dakota were sacred to the Lakota people. And they, once again, they violated a treaty when they found gold there. It was like, oh, well, so much for that treaty. And then to, to plaster the faces of these uh, uh, criminals, of uh, Washington and Jefferson and who the hell else? Lincoln and uh, Roosevelt. Lincoln, in fact, um, carried out a mass execution of Lakota when he, he was president. They were all imperialists. They were all expansionist. Um, they, you know, Jefferson, the, the Corps of Discovery, Lewis and Clark, that was to scout out the country so they could figure out how to snatch it from the Indians. Uh, so it's insulting to them. And it's not a natural monument. It's not like a, a mountain or a canyon. It's, it's uh, made by humans. And I, I totally agree with them that it, it should come down. Um, I don't think that is going to happen anytime soon, but um, uh, that's fine with me. And I think it's fine that there are no more sacred cows, that there's no one you can, um, uh, there isn't anyone above critique. There isn't anyone above being exposed. Um, uh, Columbus, it's, it's funny, today I was, there's a Columbus Circle in Midtown Manhattan and uh, I usually didn't pay attention to Columbus statue. It's on the top of a very high pedestal. So I think people generally don't look at it. But uh, with all this uh, uh, um, debate about statues today, I did look at it. And, and it's, it's barricaded now. There are barricades around it, and there's a couple of cops there to protect Columbus. Um, but uh, talk about decolonizing. I mean, my God, Columbus's name, it's... It, it's it's synonymous with America, District of Columbia. Um, all the cities named Col Columbia, uh, the con the nation of Columbia and South America. The fact that indigenous people are labeled pre and post Columbian, the guy the the Genesee there gets to define them. So I I think it's a good thing that people are questioning, and I don't care how many people sneer and call it political correctness or whatever. Or Trump says that, you know, people should go to prison because they knocked down the statue. I think it's, uh, and obviously they get the symbolism. If you remember after they invaded Iraq, they pulled down all the statues of Saddam Hussein. So they understand the importance of it. You know, the fact that they're sneering now um, uh, doesn't, uh, is, is no reason for to take them seriously. Right. And in, in the background of, of all of this is the COVID pandemic. It really seems like it's added this extra amount of stress to everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the number of deaths, The I think that's another thing, actually, that increased participation in the protests, the fact that so many people weren't working or uh, were working remotely and had uh, uh, time to, to spend. I, I think that was a, a factor. And the first obvious failure and it's not just Trump. It's easy to say it's Trump's failure because he's he's uh, such a train wreck. And I'm not defending how he handled this. But um, uh, to have a country, I, I, in fact, I don't think if this had happened a few years ago, I, I don't think it would have played out that much differently. I think a president like Obama would have been smarter and, you know, would have let the smart people uh, be up front. There would have been, I think, a little less confusion. But um, uh, in general, <clears throat> I, I don't. I think it's easy to blame Trump, but I don't blame him. Uh, only him. Um, we had a. We have a um, uh, Centers for Disease and Control that has been starved of money. Austerity didn't start with him. We. Um, uh, you know, everyone wants to blame China. And I'll say this again, by J January 23rd or 24th, China had revealed everything. They knew it was contagious. They had given the world the genome. They would created a test. Um, and it was up to this supposedly advanced nation to take it from there. But as I just said, we didn't even have, um, have masks. And uh, we didn't have a, um, a health care system that's set up to meet people's needs. It's a profit-driven Healthcare system. Then you have people out of work, or people still working, but their lives have been disrupted. So everybody's uh, <clears throat> lives have been disrupted. Uh, you may still be employed, but working from home, or your kids are not in school, so you're trying to work at a computer 
and help your kids with their homework and they need a computer or you're out of work and and this uh i this should be a major scandal that uh, people couldn't even access their unemployment benefits because uh, states were out of money or because they had an antiquated system or the people who would help them were working from home and, and not available. Whatever the reason was, uh, the fact that this is a country in great need of change is obvious. And the continued fear of this illness uh, in New York, we've done so much. People have, I've stayed home basically for three months straight. I haven't seen my family or nearby, but I haven't seen them. I haven't seen my friends. Uh, I'm, de you know, depending on Zoom calls and texting to stay in touch with people, wearing a mask all the time. I, I'm one of these people who I'm happy to wear a mask. I'm not taking a chance. Um, but uh, so we go through all this only to find out there's this resurgence in other states where people, uh, the governments there were less, um, were uh, less demanding of, uh, I don't want to say demanding, but uh, uh, parts of the country that are, are frankly very reactionary, you know, Texas and Arizona and Florida, where people don't want to listen to the government and uh, you have uh, conservative politicians in control. And so now there's a resurgence in these places. And, you know, we all live in the same country. There's no, um, you know, you could say people are supposed to go into quarantine if they come to New York from Florida. But how do you how do you really do that? How do you make sure that happens? So, um, you know, I saw a, a joke on Facebook, a meme. It said it's like a, having a group project and you're the only one who does it. But you fail anyway because other people didn't do their part. So the EU says Americans can't come to Europe and Canada is still uh, banning Americans. We can't even go next door. So uh, so the pandemic um, is, yes, has also heightened insecurity and anxiety and uh, shown um, how uh, uh, afraid our, our safety net is and shown um, uh, that we live in a failed state. So yes, absolutely. The pandemic is, uh, it's like a cloud hanging over us still. So when can we travel again? Do we want to travel? I, you know, I'm not crazy about going to a restaurant. They open restaurants, um, indoor dining in New York, but now the mayor and the governor have, um, have postponed it. So you can't go out to dinner yet. You can't, you can eat outside, but, uh, not indoors, and I think that's prudent. But, uh, you know, and this craving for some degree of normalcy, I don't think life will be the same, but to have at least some of it back. And we don't know how long we're going to have to quarantine ourselves and live with this, um, with this stress. So um, that is, uh, yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic is... Um, it's uh, it's the one thing out there that's making so many things unpredictable. Yeah, and certainly it has pointed out, as you said, the a lot of these systemic problems. And there's definitely been problems with leadership. But it seems like it's also pointing out some things that are just cultural to the population of the United States, regardless of who's in charge and regardless of the problems with the establishment itself. So like here in New Mexico, this is a state that's, quote, handled it well, and the governor here has had it be mandatory to wear pa masks in public for a while now. And in at the nearby town to where I live, Silver City, which is just a town of 10,000, but that's the closest town, um, the only place where people actually are all wearing masks is in the stores where the stores are requiring it. So if you go into a store where the store doesn't require it, then less than half of the people are. And so... It's there's this resistance that mm -hmm. that people have to to wearing the masks that is their own. Yes, we're you know this is a country. It's easy to point fingers at the leadership, but uh, we have a very um, uh, backward population. Large numbers of I mean the fact that Donald Trump got sixty million votes tells you that. Um, 
So, uh, you know, people protesting again, literally against their own best interests and bringing guns to rallies. And it's not enough to have a rally and say, uh, I want the state to reopen or I don't want to wear a mask, but you got to wear, bring a gun too. So um, it's deeply reactionary country, very divided nation, um, uh, divided, you know, states against states, parts of one state versus parts of another. You know, here in New York, upstate New York, where COVID was a lot less severe. People were angry because they said the problem wasn't as serious as it was downstate here in the New York City region. So uh, that kind of of incoherence, um, I mean, it's a good point. But now we see with this resurgence why everybody had to act like um, they uh, their situation was serious. Because if you don't, then it that can become a reality. So yes, we have a, a divided nation a nation that's deliberately been uh, dumbed down, where people are discouraged from uh, being thinkers. So all of these things that naturally divide people have been exacerbated by the uh, by the system that we uh, that we live in. So, um, yeah, I've been reading that. uh, you know, the spread now, it's not large events. So, for example, they were blaming protesters, although most of the protests I've seen, people were wearing masks. Um, you certainly can't social distance if they're if you're with hundreds of other people. But uh, it's people who just want to go to their friend's house, who just want to go to that party, who just want to go to that bar, which I understand. But uh, the fact that all caution is thrown to the wind because people are resistant and chafing under their lives changing so much. Um, uh, but, I, but I think if we had a system which, so for example, this disease happens and the U.S. says, no, no, we're going to create our own test. They messed up the test. There weren't any tests. Uh, if we had a, a country where uh, that had not happened, then maybe life could have gotten back together uh, back uh, um, as it was much sooner. But um, but we don't even have a, a coherent healthcare system. We have this patchwork quilt of for-profit systems and hospitals vary in quality. Even in here in New York City, we have some amazing hospitals here in New York City, but they weren't where the sickest people were. Um, so um, so that's um, yeah that's that's where we are. We have a population that has been where ignorance has been inculcated and ignorance has been justified and encouraged. And the end result is people who um, get mad when they're told how to keep themselves and other people safe. And on top of that, we are now also having lots of disinformation that's being spread around uh, and what some people would call conspiracy theories about it. And that's not been restricted just to the right or to the reactionary, but to people people on the left have also been indulging in this. Yes, they have. And it's been very disappointing to me. Although the other way to look at it is, you know, when there's a crisis, you find out where people stand. And uh, there are people whose politics I align with most of the time. But uh, they dispute everything they are told. And I'm not saying you can necessarily trust the government or, you know, the new uh, villain uh, is Bill Gates and uh, vaccines. His name pops up for no apparent reason. Um, So people don't believe. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, wearing a mask to me is common sense. If there's a communicable, a respiratory disease that I can get from you or you can get from me, it's common sense if we cover our mouths and our noses, then the chance of us transmitting it are a lot less. But, um, and, and everybody, social media doesn't help either. Everybody can find a, an expert that they listen to. We've all got confirmation bias. So everybody can uh, 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 link to a, a medical um, site um, and uh, say something different. So people have these theories. The other thing I find interesting is that people believe that nature plays no role. So the explanation we were given, and until I hear of something better, I'm going to stick with it, is that this is a zoonotic disease that um, 
passed from animals to human. They don't know what animal in China. It could have started in bats, but passed to other animals. It may or may not have started in that uh, uh, wet market in, in Wuhan, but it has. Um, it looks like it started in nature. But people want to think that humans are in control of everything. Why are you dismissing the idea that it could have occurred naturally? I don't, uh, I don't understand. Um, so, and there just seems to be a dismissal of um, of uh, of anything that can restrict what people uh, do. So, this combination, and people have reasons to be distrustful of the government and powerful people. You, sh- you should distrust them. But so, which theory is it? So, first, it was a theory that it started in a weapons lab in the U.S. and that. It uh, accidentally escaped. Then there was a theory that it was created deliberately to infect the Chinese. Then there was a theory that the Chinese let it escape from China. Then there was a theory that the Chinese were working with the Americans on some disease and it got out. So which theory is it? Um, I, I find it, frankly, useless unless there's more information to even indulge in that. But uh, we can see how serious or are the lack of seriousness in this country that people are so susceptible to disbelieving even common sense information and the callousness of people who say, well, you know, it's mostly older people who die and you got to die of something and you can't be afraid to die. Who are you talking about? Are you talking about yourself? Are you talking about other people? Uh, This fight over Sweden, I don't know what happened in Sweden. Sweden had a had a very limited shutdown. It's not true that they didn't have one at all, but uh, there are people who say their death rate was less than other people say it was more than other Scandinavian countries. I'm not even sure what the answer is. I haven't seen Sweden being flung around uh, the last few weeks, but, um, but even when you have the same information, we can all interpret it differently. But the idea of being prudent was not hard for me to accept. This disease passes from person to person. So the less contact you have with other people, the less of a spread you will have. I, I, that just seemed to make sense to me. But it tells you, you know, also how difficult it is to, uh, to um, get any coherence in this this country, which is not a unified country anyway, and we see it, of course, when when there's a crisis like this. But um, I, I think I, I started out saying I was disappointed with some people, but now I know where they stand. And that's a good thing. That's the um, silver lining. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Yeah, I feel like partly what we're seeing is that there are... What we we know that that governments contend towards authoritarianism, and there's people who are not able or they're not seeing the difference between authoritarianism and authorities, as in medical authorities, for example, in this case. So, I you know my own politics could probably be described as anarchist, right? And uh-huh. yet from the very beginning, I've been like, oh well, what's the common sense approach to this? Because the global medical community has had a pretty good idea of what's going on since, well, January or February, right? And so mm-hmm. they've known, here's what's happening. Here's, a, here's the common sense thing to do, you know, distancing, masks, etc. And in fact, these ways of defending ourselves against a pandemic, quarantines, etc., people have been doing this for hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of years since yeah. before we even had germ theory. So all of this is proven. And so to me, I'm not, quote, a bootlicker, as I've been called, right, for yes. wanting to, you know, wear a mask and for being happy to see that 
that there's being calls made to, to wear them, you know, but simply recognizing that there are people who are smarter than me in certain areas of knowledge, in this case, medical, and that it's smart to pay attention to what they're saying. Yeah, I mean, you've, like, you've been called a bootlegger, you, you, uh, a sheep. People are being called sheep if they wear a mask. Um, people I knew who were on the left, they were praising, you know, these crazy Trumpers who are bringing guns to rallies. And there are a couple of people on Facebook. I had to put them on pause for 30 days. I, I just could not. Uh, they were like, well, at least they're fighting for something. And I was like, what are you talking about? People bringing assault weapons to a, a protest because they're mad ab about wearing a mask during a uh, uh, a pandemic of a, a, a respiratory disease that's contagious. So I, there are a couple of people I just had to listen to a lot less. Um, it's, um, but it's really stunning to me. And I, and I think people bring them, we all bring ourselves to these things. You know, it's not just facts. So people are angry about something in their lives. They may be, uh, uh, so all the things we've mentioned has created a very angry and anxious population. And I think people are primed to be illogical. So uh, that's not uh, uh, really surprising to me. But uh, it is, um, I think it's good that we know where, um, where folks stand. Um, yeah, and that people can resort to name calling to call you a sheep because you say, well, I've waited and, you know, I've weighed the pros and cons. I've decided to wear a mask, Then, but then you're a sheep or, you know, you want, uh, do you want vaccine? I mean, vaccines, that's the other thing. Vaccines, we need vaccines. I thank God for vaccines. Kids used to die from measles before there were vaccines. Um, that does not mean they are always that the big pharma and the uh, medical establishment has our interests at heart. But uh, the world's better off that we have a polio vaccine um, and we have TB and so on and so on. So um, but I, I think this rejection of uh, I guess it, what you're saying of authorities is very pronounced in uh, in the population, and people can't even uh, discuss in a civil way uh, the differences of opinion they have. So I basically stopped responding to anything about COVID in social media, and only respond to people I agree with, which I don't like to do. I you know, but um, that's I've I've. Uh, come to the conclusion that's the, the best thing for me to do for my own sanity, um, that everybody's so atomized. I think that's the other thing. We have been, Americans are told to go it alone so much, and we're not encouraged to be in solidarity with other people. We're not encouraged to do anything that can help other people. It's, you know, it's pull up yourself by your bootstraps and the self-made man and all that stuff. So at a time when we are supposed to come together, there are people who literally don't know how to do that at all. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz really, you know, commented at one point that she felt like this was a reflection of settler colonialism in that yes. you're seeing this reaction of paranoia and individualism. And that's settler colonialism right there. It is. And people are, are also paranoid about all the wrong things. I, I mean, wrong to me. So um, and it can people can be whipped up into a frenzy over just BS. So people are um, paranoid about a vaccine. Uh, people have started saying, you're there, you're going to be forced to take vaccines. Nobody said anything about forcing you to take a vaccine. Um, people are uh, this latest. Uh, I'll call it a lie uh, about uh, Russia paying for a bounty to kill Americans in Afghanistan. There's no evidence for it. None. None. It's an anonymous intelligence official, which could be anybody or nobody. Um, at the same time, so people and it's easy to do that with Trump. Trump, the trauma of Trump's election is something that really needs to be studied. So people can be thrown into uh, this hysteria about anything related to him, 
So people believe this story because they've been told over and over again that he's a traitor. They're not even mad at him for the reasons they ought to be mad at him. Trump is, it is a Trump administration policy to impose sanctions on countries that America doesn't like. And that means people are being starved. The U.S. government policy is to starve people in Syria, to starve people in Venezuela, in Iran, in other countries. And nobody's mad about that. The thing that's really happening, that is provable, that they speak about publicly, that Democrats agree with, that the New York Times and Washington Post say are necessary, doesn't generate any paranoia, except the the big lie does. And uh, that's also a function of uh, corporate media working hand in hand with uh, the political duopoly and not presenting anything that... um, would discomfort those uh, people. Um, And uh, so people are very, very confused, uh, angry about non-existent things, angry about the wrong things, paranoid over, you know, uh, listen, I wear a mask when I leave home. I've tried to stay home as much as possible the last three months. If I go to the grocery store and I'm gone for an hour, it's no problem for me to wear a mask. And I have asthma too. So That's the newest thing. Well, some people can't breathe. It's like, I got asthma. I'm wearing a mask. I'm fine. So, uh, you know, I think there are very few people who can't do it. But that's the state we are um, in for all of uh, those reasons. Right. Do you see any, uh, well, because like sort of circling back to the George Floyd protests, what I've heard is that a lot of young people have been in attendance at these. So, so when we're talking about all these different uh, problems that we're facing in this ignorance and these old patterns from settler colonialism, do you feel as though the younger generations coming up offer any hope for a change from this? Yes, I think there's hope. Uh, the only thing that worries me is people know what they don't want, but aren't. I'm not sure they know how to articulate what they do want. Uh, so that's why it's easy for people to be confused about defunding Uh, the police and this history of settler colonialism where uh, people had to be hostile to each other. Um, You know, your goal was to invade somebody else's land or enslave someone or grab something before somebody else could. And yeah, we're still living with that and have to fight against it. Um, But uh, I think young people are, I think the, I'm, I feel very positive that they have started to say this isn't working. Sometimes I think you have to start with a, you know, a statement or you may not need to know all the answers, but I I think it's positive that people are saying this does not work. Our system doesn't work for us, doesn't work for millions of people. It works for fewer and fewer people. I was I thought it was it was kind of funny, but I was glad to see uh, protesters went out to the Hamptons on Long Island where wealthy people go in the summer and they got plastic pitchforks and went to. Bloomberg's house and some other hedge fund chieftain's house. And, you know, it was kind of theater. But I thought it was very important that people are naming and shaming the people who have created so much misery for um, for the rest of us. Yeah, I am. Uh, but I was really happy to see that, too. And I thought, OK, plastic pitchforks, that's a nice start. Eventually it will be real pitchforks. <laughs> yes, <laughs> We can only hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, but people, the other thing I've noticed is people are losing their fear. And uh, people are speaking up in their workplace. Um, the uh, New York Times, the guy who edited their op-ed page had to quit when it was revealed that he was pitching uh, op-ed pieces to Senator Tom Cotton, the, uh, one of the most right-wing Republicans. Uh, who advocated that the army be sent to stop the protests. And when it came out that Cotton didn't go to the New York Times, but the New York Times went to him, there was a revolt in the newsroom. And so he's and he's out. Um, so people who would be quiet on the job or be quiet in the university are, are losing their fear and are speaking up. And I, I think there has been a, a lot of uh, conformity in this country We've uh, come to think that we can't win, we can't get what we want, and now people are saying to hell with it, I'm going to speak up. So um, I think that's a very positive, uh, very, very positive development. 
yeah, I feel like we could quite possibly be moving in the right direction in several areas right now, you know, and that 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 is something that historically can happen in the time of an empire decline or a collapse. Yeah, there is. a We're living in the collapse. We're seeing it. Um, people act like it's going to be a movie and there's going to be something, some, you know, calamity. I mean, we're sort of seeing a calamity, but we've been seeing the collapse for a while. And uh, America shouldn't be an empire. Get rid of this empire business. We need a country that provides for our needs, that instead of a country that has uh, 800 military bases all over the world and uh, claims a right to, that's why we have police who have a right to kill. You can't have a country which says the U.S. has the right to kill people anywhere it wants and then be surprised that you have police who say they have the right to kill anywhere they want. Uh, So the empire needs to collapse, but got to be controlled demolition uh, or things could be even worse. And that's why we have to think about and talk about the country and the world we want to see, um, especially in this election year where there's been so much confusion uh, regarding Trump and we're uh, being told, I, I'm, I'm not susceptible. I'm not, I don't even vote for Democrats anymore. I'm a green, so I'm not voting for Biden. Um, but that we're told uh, that uh, Trump is the enemy, that he's the only enemy. And uh, in order to get rid of him, we've got to give up everything we really want. And we have to go um, with this guy who isn't going to give us very much that's new. No, and who also personally played a very large part in setting up these things that we are seeing aren't working, that the very things that we're protesting against, I mean, the police state and the the carceral state, Biden had a huge part in that. Yeah, he bragged, I wrote the bill. He's one of the people who wrote the current crime bill. He's just as racist as Trump. Uh, You know, in this topsy-turvy country, the first black president chose him to be his running mate because he needed to have an old racist right winger to balance the ticket. So he gets this credit he does not deserve um and uh, but we're told that's it that's all and and it's a funny thing i don't know if people can articulate it but i think people are just angry to be told there's nothing better than this the only good the only thing you can hope for is for trump not to be president but you still won't have medicare for all you still won't have living wage work but you won't have this uh, uh bigoted buffoon in the white house and that should be enough and that should be all you ask for I mean, I remain very, you know, concerned when it comes to the election of being like, well, how can we even be talking about polls? How can we even be talking about who wants to vote for who when it's been proven that we don't have free and fair elections here? And as Greg Palast has shown, you know, you you can get thrown off the the list. You can, you know, go to, to cast your vote, but then it doesn't get counted. I mean, the whole just the whole structure of elections itself has been dissolving with very little attention given to it over the last 20 years to the point where I think it, it, it seems pointless to talk about it without without pointing out that that it's broken. Absolutely. And it's forbidden to talk about it. The party, the Democrats have lost two presidential election where the, where elections where their candidate got uh, more of the popular vote. But the Democrats say nothing about getting rid of the Electoral College, do nothing about protecting the votes of black people, the people who are most likely to be victimized by the things you mentioned. Um, And uh, so we have the, you know, and uh, we're constantly being told we live in a democracy and we have the worst electoral system of any of the nations that are called democracies. So, so, um, so yes. and, And these polls, you know, and now they're, I think it's just a huge psyop to try to pull Joe Biden over the finish line. So the latest thing is Trump could drop out because polls look bad and somebody who is allegedly close to him says uh, that he's going to drop out before Election Day, which I don't believe at all. Um, uh, uh, And the, the, the fact that, you know, we're told Biden's ahead in the polls. Well, Hillary Clinton was ahead in the polls. Then the latest thing I saw was Biden's raising more money than Trump. Well, Hillary Clinton raised more money than Trump. She raised a billion dollars and then couldn't get 10,000 more votes in Michigan. And these polls, what do they mean? Who are they talking to? I mean, it's meaningless. 
But uh, we're going to hear a lot of meaningless stuff between now and uh, Election Day in November to try to prop up this rotten system and uh, and keep people from asking for and demanding for more than they've been told uh, they're going to get. Uh, has the Green Party announced its uh, candidate yet? Is it going to be Howie Hawkins? Uh, he apparently has enough delegates to win the Green Party nominating conviction is next convention is next weekend. So it'll be official next July uh, on July 11th. I believe that's the date uh, next Saturday. So then we will uh, know who the Green Party nominee will be. OK, and obviously they're not going to have like uh, an in-person convention. No, it's going to be virtual, which is disappointing to me. Um, all, you know, and that's the other thing. About, I'm just going to digress a little bit. That's the other thing that's difficult about this quarantine. All these um, are these opportunities to be with people we want to be with, friends and family and comrades have just been taken away from us, and everything's a Zoom call instead. But uh, anyway, I digressed a little bit there. That, so that's causing a lot of anxiety. But uh, but yes, I'm agreeing. We'll know who the nominee will be. Uh, next weekend, and um, I and I just want to say too, I I do not want to hear again about the Green Party uh, stealing votes from the Democrats. The Democrats, it's it's the Democrats have to prove to the people why they picked Biden, how he's going to win, what's their plan, what's his route to electoral college victory. It's up to them to tell. Uh, their voters. Um, but they have um, perfected this propaganda to make people angry at each other, to deflect blame from themselves because they screwed up so badly and Trump won. But it's their responsibility. And people on the left should not feel obliged to explain who they're going to vote for or if they're not going to vote. It's up to them to explain how they are going to put Joe Biden in the White House. It's on The onus is on them. So uh, people really need to push back when we hear that stuff. Yeah, no, that's just a bunch of BS is what it is. You know, I mean, that this goes back to Florida in 2000, where 12 times as many registered Democrats voted for Bush as voted for Nader. And yet somehow it's Nader's fault. Yes, yes. Democrats have crossed party lines to vote for Bush. And they stole the. They did not allow. They took black people off the rolls. And didn't let them vote. So Gore didn't get their votes, the, the votes he needed in order to win. But the Democrats never said anything. Um, and they certified the Electoral College uh, result, which they did not have to do. And same thing again, 20 years later, uh, 16 years later, rather, uh, Hillary Clinton got the popular vote. Who demanded that the votes be counted? The Green Party. Not Hillary Clinton, not the Democrats. So um, even though that was controversial among the Greens, but because uh, there were some people who said it wasn't their fight and, uh, uh, you know, no one should respond to this charge that um, that uh, uh, they were at fault for Trump uh, winning. But uh, we, we've got to be ready for this again, because I believe Trump can win again. I'm not falling for any of this stuff. There are millions of people, all the people we've talked about, carrying guns to rallies, a couple in St. Louis who came out of their house with guns to confront people protesting, walking past their house, not bothering them. Uh, there are a lot of people like them. And uh, I keep hearing that, well, Trump messed up COVID so badly. There were people who thought he would be better and so they won't vote for him again. There are people who will vote for him again. And when you have a candidate who doesn't, th there are millions of people who are not motivated to vote. For whatever reason, they don't care that much. But to get them out, you have to have a candidate who brings some excitement, who's talking about actually doing something for them. I, for the life of me, I can't tell you what Biden says he's going to do. He just says he's not going to be Trump, but he's going to continue all his foreign policies, though. So um, and we're supposed to not care about foreign policy. That's the other thing we're not supposed to think about. And we're supposed to be uh, happy to have uh, uh, a, an aggressive nation and, and be satisfied. But uh, but those are some of the things that we have to look out for in uh, this election cycle. 
it seems like the Black Alliance for Peace really is able to bring a lot of clarity to all of these issues, especially the connection between domestic and international. Yeah, it's it's very it's vital. It's very important. I was invited. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Communist Party of Ireland invited me to uh, a webinar and an interview. Um, we, Black Alliance for Peace, had a webinar on um, AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command, uh, um, shut, uh, rise up to shut down AFRICOM and get U.S. troops out of Africa. And we had a couple hundred people on a call, people from uh, on the continent. We were fortunate enough to get people who could get French translation so that Francophone Africans could join the conversation. Um, it is really vital um, that we make all of these connections and we don't just talk about um, getting rid of qualified immunity for the police in this country. And we talk about closing U.S. military bases and we talk about um, uh, this uh, capital predatory capitalist system, which does so much damage to people. We have to connect connect the dots. That's what we were always told during the Russiagate fraud. Uh, connect the dots, you know, because uh, Donald Trump Jr. talked to a Russian that was supposed to be a dot, but um, uh, the dots are there. The militarism, the state violence, the impunity uh, for killing, the uh, political corrupt corruption. Um, the austerity that's demanded by the billionaires who rule us, who bought, by the way, Mike Bloomberg has pretty much purchased the Democratic Party during his very brief uh, run. He uh, demanded and got a change. He was supposed to be uh, uh, restricted from the debates because he didn't have enough support, but he gave him money and that was the end of that. And uh, his goal and that of other super wealthy people is to make sure that the Democratic Party doesn't bring up any issues um, that will benefit the people, the issues that would actually help the Democrats win. That's why beating Bernie Sanders was their priority. That was their big election. I also think they wouldn't be too unhappy if Trump won. I, I really don't. But their goal was to shut down forever any talk of reform uh, within the Democratic Party. And people have to own that. The, the uh, You know, we can work within the Democrats and we can make demands on them. You've got to own the reality. So stop gaslighting people about what the you know they can do inside the Democratic Party when the Democratic Party is just happy as it can be the way it is already and does not want to change. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen Ted Rawls' new book yet, but he goes into the whole thing and just shows it. And of course, he does the graphic novel form, being a cartoonist, you know? And so mm -hmm. he, he goes through the last, mostly the last 40 years of democratic history, but then he also dips back to FDR, et cetera, and just shows how these forces within the Democratic Party have just been pushing it more and more to the right with each election. And they've been, you know, they've been winning at doing this, you know, each time. I actually thought that the book um, was uh, would make a good companion uh, to your book, Presidential, uh, Black America and the Presidents. Yes, it's a, I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I know you interviewed him, but um, I have not uh, got the chance to listen to it yet. Um, but yes, we have to talk about history. And um, that's one of the reasons I, I enjoyed writing my book so much was... Um, that we have to figure out, we have to talk about how we ended up where we are. And my book, by looking at the presidency, shows that um, the settler colonial state made anti-blackness foundational to the country. And um, I, I'm glad people are talking about changing that. But that's a, it's a heavy lift, though. And uh, I'm not saying it can't be done. People are taught to, we're taught to think the way we do now. We can be taught to think uh, another way. So um, just as, you know, it seemed impossible that, you know, anybody would, uh, that they would take down Confederate monuments in Richmond and now they're down and Columbus needs a, a police guard in New York City, that means we can go even further and we can push even further uh, for a change. But we have to be honest about this system and this idea that I'm supposed to celebrate, let's say Biden wins, I'm supposed to be happy 
that this horrible man is president who isn't going to cut the military budget. You cannot have a decent a system that um, meets the needs of the people when the military uh, takes up 60 percent of the budget. You can't have that. And he's not going to change that. So what is going to change for people if they're not going to raise the minimum wage, if they're, we're not going to have a health care system that cares for everybody, if we're going to have continue with endless wars, what do you get with Biden? OK, you get better federal judicial nominees, and that's not a small thing, but that's about it. I mean, as far as any improvement from one to uh, another, and this idea that I'm supposed to celebrate if this awful man wins is, is really, it's just offensive to me. And it really makes me angry that we are supposed to not only go hold our noses and vote for him, but be happy too if he wins. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. It does feel like 2016 all over again, where it's like, I, I don't want either of these people to win. Yeah, no, no, you don't want either one of them to win. Um, but we have to talk about very radical change. We have to talk about revolutionary change. And I know that's a scary word to a lot of people. And we have to talk about what that means. But people, we need to stay in motion. And, um, you know, when we have change in this country... It's because of the demand from the bottom. When we have change, it's because the people create a political crisis. And everybody loves to talk about the civil rights movement as if, it, you know, somebody made demands and that was it. Black people got the right to vote. But no, there was a mass movement um, and um, uh, created a crisis. And so uh, Lyndon Johnson had to act. And that's what we need again. And we can't stay... Um, be satisfied with Joe Biden. The crisis has to continue if he's the one inaugurated in January. The necessity of creating a political crisis. Yes, absolutely. That's when you get change. When do you get change? You get change when, when people upset uh, the apple cart. When people say that's not... Look what happened when after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, they were trying their best not to arrest those cops, especially the one who... Uh, uh, the killer who put his knee on his neck, but somebody burned down the police station. Uh, people marched on the, the, the prosecutor. Prosecutors are in bed with the cops. He said, I don't think there's anything criminal here. People went to the man's house and protested at his house. And somebody burned down the precinct. And that's a political crisis. So the usual... Uh, well, we're going to fire them. That was not happening. Well, we're going to arrest the main culprit. People were, no, it still didn't work. People weren't happy until they were all arrested, all of them. And that means they won't be happy if they get off either. So um, I, I'm careful about telling people to do things like burn police stations. There's a case here in New York of two lawyers who are facing 40 years in prison because they vandalized an already vandalized police car. Um, you know, they put a firecracker in a police car. They're all, the window was already broken. It was vandalized. Nobody was sitting in it. But uh, the local prosecutor caved. And now there's federal prosecution and the state is really hitting them with the hammer. So I'm careful about advising people to do those things. But when they happen, that's when we get what we want. It's very, it's very simple. Had there not been that, uh, the ante had not been up, that cop would still be sitting in his house instead of sitting in a jail cell. I'm convinced that's the case. Yeah, and it is encouraging that it seems like people are willing to up the ante these days. Yes, I think that speaks to the depth of, of the anger and the depth of the suffering on so many levels that we are, that we are seeing in this country. And we're never, you know, it's never talked about. Nobody, it's rare for the press doesn't tell you, the politicians don't tell you. Half the people in this country are low income, half. The minimum wage hasn't gone up for years. People still go broke if they get sick. And, uh, you know, people may seem to be going along with it, but once the opportunity shows itself for uh, people to start expressing their angst, well, that's when you can have real change in a country. Yeah, I've been encouraged to, to see it personally.
definitely. Um, we've been talking for a little bit over an hour. Maybe you could tell us um, about where to find your book and where to find your column and this and that. Sure. Uh, the book is Prejudential, Black American and the Black America and the Presidents. You can get it from Amazon. Uh, if you don't want to use Amazon, you can go to the publisher, Steerforth Press. That's steerforth.com. Uh, there's a paperback, an ebook, and an audio book. You can get the audio book on Audible. Uh, and that's you, can, uh, that's you reading it too, right? Yes, it is. It's me reading, and, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, you can read me on Twitter. My handle is Freedom Ride Blog. Uh, my column is in Black Agenda Report every week, blackagendareport.com. And I'm on Patreon, patreon.com slash Margaret Kimberly. And Kimberly is EY, by the way. And you can read everything I put on Patreon for five bucks. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thanks so much, Margaret. It's always wonderful to talk to you. You too. Thank you so much. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.